now that we know how to uh, average returns over some period of time, how do we actually risk adjust performance? Well, some of these measures we've talked about before, primarily the uh, sharp ratio. Uh, but there are several of them. They all have their own place, so it's important to uh, go through them. Uh, they all sort of pick up on different aspects uh, of risk-adjusted returns. So the sharp ratio we've, of course, seen from portfolio theory, uh, from the CAPM. The basic idea is that it's sort of our measure of total uh, performance relative to total risk, uh, which therefore is perhaps the most fundamental measure of the attractiveness of an investment if you're sort of choosing an investment wholesale. You want to, uh, as we saw, move to the highest possible indifference curve between risk and return. Um, you want to choose the steepest capital allocation line, um, and therefore probably the asset with the highest uh, performance relative to total risk. But is it, um, is it all necessarily as simple as that? Well, what about uh, just systematic risk? So remember, total risk may make sense if you are uh, looking at sort of overall one investment versus another. But once you've actually established an investment portfolio, uh, then what may make sense, especially if it's a well-diversified one, uh, is more like a measure of performance relative to systematic risk, which is what the trainer Mazui measure um, actually gets you. You can see that it's similar to the Sharpe ratio. In fact, the numerator, the excess return, is the same, but the denominator now is the beta of this uh, new risk asset or new portfolio that you're thinking of adding uh, to your existing position. And the trainer Mazui measure might come up uh, particularly when you are already holding a well-diversified portfolio. You don't really care about total risk as much because being well-diversified, the idiosyncratic portion of total risk is already uh, minimized. So really you're just curious how much a new position will add to your systematic risk, which is exactly what your beta uh, would capture, at least relative to a single index model. Um, obviously we've already talked a lot about alpha in our factor model discussions, both for the CAPM and the multi-factor APT type asset pricing models. Remember that's excess return over a portfolio uh, expected return relative to the factor model. Um, so we can have a cap M alpha, a three or four factor or five factor, any number of multi-factor model alphas. Uh, but essentially all it is is just the difference between your actual portfolio return and the factor model predicted portfolio return, whether it's a single factor cap M or a multi-factor APT. Uh, now, the alpha is perhaps uh, uh, necessary but not sufficient as a criterion for uh, the quality of an investment, because remember, even if you beat uh, sort of the expected return from factors, uh, a strategy that has alpha may actually have really high uh, active risk. In other words, the idiosyncratic risk that's not explained by those factor models. Uh, you can think of things like investing in distressed debt, uh, investing in uh, short volatility positions by selling options. Uh, they can have alpha because those risks are not captured by common risk factors, but they also have a substantial um, idiosyncratic risk component. So having alpha is sort of a necessary condition, but it's not necessarily sufficient as a condition for the investment being good. Now, speaking of which, the information ratio uh, is a way to sort of take the idiosyncratic risk into account. Um, and what this does is exactly it looks at the alpha but weights it by uh, how much idiosyncratic risk this uh, 
portfolio or asset or trading strategy would introduce uh, in your portfolio. Um, so that would capture this idea that uh, perhaps even if you outperform a risk model, you might still be taking a lot of um, unexplained and potentially unpriced risk. So which of these measures you actually will weight uh, really depends on sort of your context. Uh, you'll probably want to consider the performance of any prospective investment uh, using all of these. And in fact, we'll talk about a few more in just a little bit. Uh, but which one will be dominant, because it's seldom that all will agree, uh, will really depend on what your goals are. So if your goal is to sort of select one investment where you previously have had none, uh, you might want to use uh, sort of an overall risk criterion relative to return, and that would be the shock ratio. And if you already have a well-diversified portfolio and you're just thinking about adding another position to it, then you probably want to use the criterion that just measures your performance relative to the additional systematic risk uh, that this new position will, will add. Uh, so that would be the, uh, the trainer ratio. So we can call it TR for trainer ratio or trainer Mizui ratio. If you are thinking of adding an active strategy to a well-diversified passive portfolio, we'll denote that as uh, A plus P. So you have already an active, uh, sorry, a passive position and perhaps some well-diversified indices, uh, but now you're thinking of adding a uh, active strategy, perhaps adding an investment in a hedge fund or private equity or some sort of alternative investment uh, process, uh, then you might want to use the information ratio. And generally, generally it'll be the case that if uh, the investment you're considering has positive alpha, it'll also have better sharp trainer and information ratios. Uh, but again, the alpha might not be the uh, critical criterion that you would want to depend on. So now let's look at an example. Let's say that we have a portfolio that we're asked to consider. And what we know is that this portfolio has an expected return relative to, let's say, some factor model of 35%. And we also know that the market has an expected return of 28% um, per year. So this portfolio does beat the market, at least in uh, risk unadjusted terms. In fact, it beats it by 7%. Uh, but is this actually a good portfolio? Well, let's apply this tool set uh, that we just laid out to, to answer it. Well, first of all, we probably need to know more things about this portfolio because remember for the uh, trainer ratio, we need to know betas. For the information ratio, we need to know idiosyncratic risk. And for the sharp ratio, we need to know total risk. But we can calculate these if we actually fit a, uh, let's say, a single index model in this case. Remember, that will allow us to decompose uh, total risk into systematic and idiosyncratic risk. We also need to know what the risk-free rate is. But that is easily enough done. We can just look at the yield on treasury bonds. So now let's calculate the sharp uh, ratio, the trainer Mazui ratio, uh, the alpha, and the information ratio. So the sharp ratio, remember, is the expected return minus the risk-free rate over total risk. We plug those givens in, and we see that the sharp ratio of our candidate portfolio is 0.69. How does that stack up to the market? Well, the market's ex expected return of 28% still compared against the risk-free rate of 6, of course. 
uh, and divide it by the market's total risk of 30%, uh, it seems like the market actually has a higher Sharpe ratio. Uh, so that's not actually a good sign for this portfolio, even though it beats the market in raw terms. Uh, it actually turns out that once you risk adjust, at least using total risk, uh, then it no longer does per unit. What about in terms of per unit of systematic risk only? Well, uh, we're gonna keep our numerators the same, remember, expected minus risk-free. Uh, those will be the same for both the market and for our uh, candidate portfolio, but now we're gonna normalize by systematic risk as measured by our single index uh, beta exposure. And our portfolio has a higher loading on the uh, market risk factor than the market portfolio itself. Of course, remember, the market portfolio always has a loading of one on the market portfolio by definition, uh, but our portfolio has a loading of 1.2. And when we normalize ex uh, excess returns by that, we see that the trainer ratio for our candidate portfolio is actually higher than that of the market. So on this measure, uh, our candidate portfolio outperforms. Now, if we combine that with what we know from the Sharpe ratio, essentially what these tell us is that this candidate portfolio takes more idiosyncratic risk, but at least per unit of systematic risk, uh, it does better. Which will then, you know, which one of these we will depend on will sort of depend on uh, what our current portfolio status actually is. Now we can also measure the alpha, of course. Remember the alpha of the market by definition is zero because uh, the market has a beta of one and that fully explains the market's own returns. So there's no deviation from expected returns. Uh, but what about the deviation from our candidate portfolios expected returns? Well, remember the expected return uh, according to the CAPM would be the risk-free rate plus our beta 1.2 uh, times the risk premium in the market, which is the expected return in the market minus uh, the 6% risk-free rate. So in other words, the expected return on this portfolio, uh, according to the CAPM, is 32.4. We know that the actual expected return is 35. Therefore, this portfolio has an alpha of 2.6 per year which is uh, encouraging, but remember, alpha is not necessarily a, uh, by itself, credible uh, indicator. And in a way, this also helps to further explain uh, why this portfolio outperforms in terms of just systematic risk. It's likely because to get this outperformance in the trainer ratio, it's simply taking some idiosyncratic risk, which is driving this alpha. Uh, so then finally, let's actually compute the information ratio, which will uh, take that into account. So we'll take our alpha, we'll divide it by our idiosyncratic risk of 18%, and we see that it's 0.14. Uh, of course, for the market, we don't really know what its information ratio is because it has neither alpha nor idiosyncratic risk. Uh, so let's just say that that's zero. Um, generally, for all of these, higher is better, but we can't really make a very credible information ratio comparison. And the other thing is perhaps it makes sense to compare uh, the Sharp ratio and tra trainer Mizui ratios on a relative basis because being ratios, they're um, sort of hard to quantify. Really, we just need to know whether uh, our candidate portfolio has a greater or lesser one uh, than the market. So for example, if we take the ratio of those ratios, as it were, uh, we would look for a relative ratio greater than one, because that would mean that the sharp ratio of our candidate portfolio is greater than the sharp ratio of the market. As it is, we know it's the opposite. So the relative sharp ratio is less than one, uh, that does suggest that this portfolio is worse than the market. On the other hand, the relative trainer Mizui ratio uh, is actually greater than one because 
that ratio is higher for a candidate portfolio than that for the market. So this portfolio is then better than the market according to that measure. Uh, and of course we know that the information ratio for a portfolio is, well, higher than the markets, but then again that's zero mostly just due to mathematical reasons. Um, and we know that the alpha is positive as well, but then again, you know, the market alpha is not going to be uh, anything other than zero anyway. But we do know some things that we can now use to make a decision. If, for example, we had no current investments, uh, we would probably not choose this candidate portfolio. Uh, we'd rather choose the market because overall, so from a total risk perspective, uh, we'd be better off holding the market portfolio. On the other hand, if we had an existing well-diversified position, uh, we may actually want to add this candidate portfolio or asset to it because even though it does seem to take some idiosyncratic risk to get this outperformance relative to systematic risk, uh, relative to the market portfolio and the trainer mizui ratio, uh, well, if we have a well-diversified portfolio already and this new portfolio is not going to be a big part of it, uh, then whatever idiosyncratic risk it introduces uh, will be mitigated. And that's sort of what uh, the information ratio and alpha tell us is that there is uh, excess performance there, it just comes with some idiosyncratic risk, and at bottom it's just a matter of whether we are okay uh, with holding it if we can actually diversify.